social science experiments over um, sort of uh, my career to date, um, and particularly going to sort of walk you through a couple of um, experiments that I've done uh, with Brendan Nyhan and sort of show you how sort of key lessons I've learned at, at, at different points um, along the way. And so the overview um, is when you're doing social science experiments, and so one of the things that we're really interested in as social scientists is trying to understand um, what people think, how they think, how they behave, um, and hopefully this ultimately ends up being of use to people who are doing um, these amazing, this amazing field work of, of getting people vaccinated. And there's some fairly simple lessons sort of as a starting point to signpost where I'm going, which is, one, when you're starting a new project, a new experiment, is be excited about it. If you're not really excited about it, it's hard to muster the, um, the energy that it takes um, to do it well. Nothing ever goes quite as you expect, and I will take you through um, at a couple of key points in uh, some of these experiments where things haven't gone the way that we expected um, and how those haven't necessarily been bad. And in fact, in one particular case, it's been really good for me and Brendan and our careers. Um, when you're doing social science experiments, so not sort of field trials, but things that are in a lab or in a survey that aren't directly on the, you know, delivering some sort of interventions to the population of interest, is you want to think about the external validity. You want to make sure that your materials represent in some way what actually would occur in the real world or, or a reasonable facsimile. Um, you want to think about the appropriate population is. So when you're doing um, intervention work, it's very obvious you're going to focus on the correct population. Um, when you're doing some of the background social science research that may lead to that, there are choices that you have to make. Um, usually these are budget related, um, which is if you're trying to do uh, things related to childhood vaccination, the population of interest is really parents doing surveys and getting um, uh, samples of parents that you can do quality studies on turns out to be really expensive. And there are lots of less expensive ways that you can get subject populations. The dogs are now running. They're very cute. Um, uh, and, and so it, it's important to keep that sort of trade-off in mind. Do you do a $60,000 study or do you do a $3,000 study in which you have to sort of hope that the lessons or the, 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 the inferences you're going to be able to draw uh, go back to your target population. Um, I think that it's essential for good social science to have very clear theoretical expectations. That theory should be driving our work. And sometimes when we're doing field interventions, there may be sort of more I empirically driven questions, but I think that clear theoretical expectations um, are important. And then finally, you want to think about um, the outcomes and the outcomes you're going to measure. So, so let me tell you sort of a sort of background of how um, Brendan and I came to work together and how we uh, sort of came to this topic. Um, I forgot to start my timer, so I know how much time I have. I'm keeping track. Okay. Um, I always lamented how bad academics are at keeping track of time in presentations. Um, so uh, Brendan and I were in graduate school together. I got my first faculty job at, the, uh, at Loyola University of Chicago. And a, my first month there, I realized they had a subject pool. Um, Brendan and I had always been friendly and had wanted to work together, so I called him and said, hey, we have this chance. There's this subject pool. We can put an experiment on with uh, Loyola undergraduates. Let's try and find something to work together. And so what we came up with, we were trying to understand why is it that in fall of 2005, um, long into the Iraq war, when it had long been established that there uh, were no weapons of mass destruction, why did a sizable proportion of the American public continue to believe that, in fact, there were weapons of mass dis destruction in Iraq? Um, and we designed a simple experiment in which we had a couple of different conditions. Um, we had a baseline condition in which we gave people a, a Bush speech from 2004. We had a correction condition um, in which we had gave people the exact same material and added a paragraph correcting that information. And then we actually had a third condition um, in which we corrected the information in a slightly different way. Um, that third condition doesn't actually end up in the publication, um, uh, the version that got published, in part because the theory upon which we drew, we actually got wrong, and we did the manipulation, we, we screwed it up. Um, but that actually ends up being OK, because originally what we were trying to do was cor correct, compare this one form of correction versus this other form of correction. And what we found was that 
when you gave uh, liberals this extra paragraph, compared to the group that didn't have the extra paragraph, the proportion who believed that um, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction decreased. So this would make sense. You have this sort of baseline condition that's a Bush speech in which he talks about the threat of weapons of mass destruction. This extra paragraph that's corrective that says, on the same day that Bush gave this speech is the day the CIA released a report saying that um, there were no weapons of mass destruction um, that were found. What we found was that the difference between conservatives in these two corrections, or two versions, uh, the baseline and the baseline plus correction, also created a difference, except it just went in the wrong way. <clears throat> that telling conservatives that in fact there were no weapons of mass destruction actually seemed to cause them to believe that which was wrong even more strongly. Um, so this was actually the really sort of serendipitous moment of a, an experiment that had gone wrong. We, were, we had these two versions of correction. We realized we got the sort of the theory wrong on one. We were trying to salvage the article. Um, we decided to look at how the correction, the one that we got right, um, might interact with um, underlying preferences. And we found this pretty amazing um, result that we've been able to replicate lots of times. We've even replicated it to, uh, in a nuanced, uh, importantly nuanced way with um, vaccines. And so this sort of led us to the view that, you know, this is how we wish the, the world worked. You know, the facts are coming, the facts are coming, and everything's going to be all right. Um, and we've come to the conclusion that really this is probably more often how the world works. And it's people really don't want to hear information that runs strongly counter to information that's an important part of who they are. And so partisan identity is really important in the United States. So when people are being given information that runs counter to their political predispositions, it is really challenging. Um, and people, if you give them this corrective information, what we think is going on at the sort of mechanism level is that people are coming up with all of the reasons why that information is wrong and why what they already believe is correct. Um, and that process makes, reinforces their ultimate beliefs. And so to this, we sort of came to the sort of this underlying problem of misperceptions. We thought that we had this really simple one-off study. Um, why uh, do Americans hold continuing misperceptions about the existence of WMD in Iraq? We'll figure out, you know, we'll figure out here are these two versions to correct. We'll figure out which one is better. Boom. Uh, paper done, we can go on now. We've still been doing this for 10 years now. Um, and so we've come to this problem of, of misper misperceptions, come to the realization that while some people are uninformed, other people are misinformed. These are separate and different problems. And that misperceptions, being actively misinformed, may be a particularly difficult um, problem to solve. And that when there are misperceptions, there, in fact, might be multiple causes of how we get there. So one might be information deficits. We've talked for uh, a couple of days now about the, sort of the information deficit model. And there are times when the information deficit model probably works. There's probably a big difference between, I know that uh, the MMR vaccine causes autism. This is being recorded, I think, for a podcast, which we know is not true. But people who say that that I know and people, oh, I heard this. I saw it on a TV show. Um, so that first group. Just giving them more information may not be particularly effective. That second group, where it's not really sort of fully hardened yet, it might be. Um, we know that challenges to important uh, beliefs spark counter-arguing. So are there ways in which we can get people to be more open to counterintuitive information? Um, Brenda and I have looked at that in some other work. There are sort of consistent cognitive biases and failures of memory that, that uh, humans have. And out there, there's sort of a proliferation of misinformation. And then ultimately, this means there are a lot of different possible routes to addressing the problem of misperceptions. So information deficits, one way to try and solve that problem is through better, more usable information. Um, when we are talking about how challenges spark counter-arguing, that the extent to which information or there are scenarios in which we can reduce the threat to people that counter that counter attitudinal information poses may make information um, more persuasive. Um, when we think about cognitive biases, how are ways in which we can take human the fallibility of human memory and the fallibility of human cognition 
um, into effect. And when we have sort of, when there's proliferation of misinformation, how can we change the underlying incentive structure for people to express misinformation in the first place? So as a political scientist who does vaccine stuff, um, some of the time it's very terrifying in a Republican primary debate where um, there's this sort of moment where Republicans are given the opportunity to express um, concern about vaccines and vaccine schedules um, because it's really terrifying the extent to which vaccination could become a partisan issue like perceptions of WMD. So that's really, um, that's really terrifying. Um, so one of the sort of, I think, temptations when you're designing experiments and trying to understand how all of these different things play together is, oh my God, there are all these things that matter. Let's try and figure out the grand experiment that solves all of these problems at once. And if there's one thing that I've learned in um, you know, 10 years of doing this, 15 years of being a political scientist, if you include grad school, um, before graduate school, I worked in um, political polling uh, and campaign consulting. If there's anything I've learned in 20 years, it's don't try and do everything at once, a temptation that I still have to fight against today. So I think that we want to try whenever possible. So I think one of the main lessons is whenever possible, if you're trying to understand under, the world is not monocausal. But we want to try and design studies and experiments that isolate as few factors as possible. And this is a real, real challenge. This is a challenge that, I, that Brendan and I face is we always have the temptation to add one more thing. So when you, add, when you do complex multifactorial designs, that the more conditions you add, you're automatically reducing your statistical power. They, if you get one sort of aberrant result, it really complicates your ability to figure out what the data are telling you. Is this statistical noise? Is this something that's real? really in, uh, increases the difficulty of telling a clean story. Um, Two-way interactions are difficult enough to communicate to lay audiences. So when I say an interaction, which is how does one variable alter the effect of a second variable? And so if you're talking about two forms of experimental manipulations, how does the presence or absence of one manipulation affect the causal effect of a second manipulation? This is when you start getting into three and four-way interactions. I mean, four-way interactions makes my head explode. Um, and it's so three-way interaction would be how would the presence or absence of some third manipulation affect the extent to which a second manipulation um, alters the effect of a first? Um, but the temptation is always to add another. Like, here's another thing that's really important. Or if you're worried about being able to get publications, it's sort of a hedging strategy, right? If our first manipulation doesn't work, if we have a second one and it does work, we always have that as a fallback for being able to get a second uh, publication out of it. And this is particularly difficult if you think that there are important attitudinal or demographic moderators. So if you think that the effect of one manipulation is affected by something like your pre-existing attitudes, well, if you have two manipulations and you think there's some sort of attitude thing, you're already in the world of three-way interactions. They're really difficult to, I mean, they're not hard to do statistically. They're really hard to try and communicate what they mean. Um, and we have papers that have gone nowhere literally almost for a decade because they're complicated and we can't tell a consistent story. Um, so cognitive neuroscience, I don't actually have anything to say about cognitive neuroscience, but there are some studies that show that if you put pictures of a brainy image, um, that your talk is more persuasive. So I now always try and include one in my talks. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the pediatrics um, study and some of our theoretical motivations. So the first was this idea of motivated reasoning. People have goals when they are processing information. And one of these goals may be directional goals. That is, there is a conclusion they want to reach and how they uh, encounter information, how they process information is heavily influenced by the end goal that they want to have. The second was prospect theory. So one of the most um, profound results in social science over the last, I don't know, however many long, in just the history of social science um, is prospect theory. And so this is the canonical Tversky and Kahneman disease experiment in which people are randomly assigned either to receive a choice from the gain frame or a choice from the loss frame. In the gain frame, you get to choose between one of two treatments. If treatment A is, is a town of, uh, or a population of 600 people, if treatment A is adopted, 200 people will be saved. 
If treatment B is adopted, there's a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds probability that no people will be saved. In the loss frame, you're told, well, if treatment C is adopted, 400 people will die. If treatment D is adopted, there's a one-third probability that nobody will die and a two-third probability that 600 people will die. So one of the things that if you haven't seen this before, so if you've seen this before, you already know what the trick is. If you haven't seen it before, what you're probably realizing is that those are, in fact, exactly the same. But what's amazing, and this runs counter to what underlying economic theory would be, is that how these choices are presented have profound effects on the choice that people choose. So in the gain frame, people choose the certain option at about a 3 to 1 ratio to the uncertain option. In the loss frame, people choose the uncertain option, option D, at about a 3 to 1 ratio to the certain option. So these are exactly the same choice sets, but how the information is presented, whether it's presented as a gain, saving, or presented as a loss, fundamentally and profoundly changes how people answer the question. And so that the underlying idea is that when we're in the, in the domain of losses, that people become more risk, accept, risk accepting, so they choose the, the riskier or the uncertain option. So this, this influenced the um, manipulations that we chose for our pediatrics study. So um, we had five conditions. We had a control condition, and then we had four manipulations. Um, one was corrective information debunking the MMR autism link. And then we had three different manipulations where we were trying to put people into the domain of losses to see if the domain of losses affected preferences um, over vaccination. And so one was a uh, just text uh, taken from CDC about the risks of disease. Another was a um, story, um, sort of disease narrative about sort of the dangers of, of, of getting a, a disease and having a high fever. Um, and then some disease images um, so pictures of getting uh, measles, mumps, or rubella. Um, and we worked with uh, the pediatrician, uh, Gary Freed, who in a small world study, my father, who's an uh, academic physician, actually worked with like in the 19, like, late 70s. Um, and he's like, oh, I thought that name was familiar. Um, and the underlying idea was to, and I think I'm paraphrasing um, what uh, Dr. Freed said, which was, you know, basically, can we scare them into compliance? Can we scare people into compliance? Um, so I actually think that, that that's potentially one place where we went wrong on this study, right? So is trying to scare people, this isn't really about fear, the gain frame versus the loss frame. This is sort of a, a cognitive difference. Is, in fact, trying to scare people into compliance, is that really the same thing as prospect theory? I, mean, I think that's an open question. I'm sure that there, there are, um, there's a body of social science on this that I'm uh, not up to date on, but I, I think that that's a, you know, how fear appeals work is, I, I believe, continues to be a really contested um, issue. So our study design, um, another choice that we had to make is that we were really interested in um, how, because we're interested in motivated reasoning, we want to know what people's pre-treatment attitudes were. Um, but we wanted to be able to use those in a way that didn't, um, prime the things that we were after in the experiment. So what we ended up doing was a two-wave study. So we asked people, uh, we interviewed um, uh, parents in way of uh, children uh, ages 18 and younger with the children living in their household on a number of things, including a, a vaccine scale, and then later, on average about a week to 10 days later, we invited them to take a second part of the study where we actually put them into the randomization so that way we could have our pretreatment attitudes sufficiently before they were really primed um, for the, asking those to really influence um, uh, what happened. And then we have the, um, uh, after that, we sort of measured some vaccine um, attitudes again post-treatment. So here, just um, briefly, I don't, this is obviously tiny text, I don't expect you to read it, but this is just sort of to drive home the, the point of the external validity. So our the correction of vaccine misinformation, this is language taken from the CDC website. I think we edited it just slightly, um, but it's pretty much taken verbatim from um, CDC. Um, 
Same thing with our disease, danger, condition, the text, again, taken pretty much verbatim from the CD website. So trying to emphasize the external validity um, as much as possible. Uh, here's our disease danger narrative. Um, one of the things that was really interesting about this is that this particular condition, while it had no direct effect on um, vaccine attitudes compared to the control, um, telling people about sort of bad things of not being vaccinated, whether this is just a one-off result or not, did increase people's concern about side effects about vaccines. So if you tell people about bad things that are happening, it, there's at least some early suggestive evidence that should be followed up on there that seems to highlight concerns about side effects um, overall. And then here are the scary images um, trying to scare people into compliance. Um, and so what we found in this experiment was, I think, particularly interesting, and we're trying to find ways to, to follow up um, where we can really get at this, because I think it answers in many respects. I mean, it raises more questions than, than it answers in many respects. So unlike our previous sort of directly political work, the people who receive the correction condition actually change um, in the direction that we want and their belief that MMR causes autism. So that's good, or at least it seems good at first glance. It turns out to be problematic in that it actually also decreases among the group that is least favorable toward vaccines. It also decreases the, likely, the reported likelihood of vaccinating future children. So we have this sort of interesting break between more abstract attitudes about um, vaccines and behavioral intentions. Um, and that's something that we need to come back to and try and follow up on more. So for our future work, here's just sort of a quick um, self-plug for what we're working on um, in the future. So there are sort of four studies that we are working on. So there's one right now, and just we're looking at disgust sensitivity as a predictor of vaccine hesitancy or vaccine attitudes. Um, He's about to give me the sheet telling me I'm almost out of time, um, or that I'm out of time. Um, so disgust sensitivity are questions about, you know, how disgusted or grossed out do you get by stepping on dog poo, um, which we actually, we ran that in both the U.S. and in the U.K., so we had a surprisingly long conversation about whether we needed to change that U.S.-based question from poop uh, to poo for the uh, U.K.-based question. I never thought I would say that in public on a, in a speaking thing. Um, <clears throat> so we have another uh, a, a study in which we're trying to, based on some work about climate change attitudes, that if you explain how climate change works, because um, most people don't un really understand sort of the greenhouse effect and what it actually means um, and how sort of energy, you know, if, if energy can come in through the atmosphere, why does it get trapped and then bounce back? Why doesn't it go back out? Um, and so an experiment which we sort of simply explain here how vaccines work and whether that changes um, opinions. We have a, a cross-national comparison study of vaccine attitudes um, across several industrialized nations. Um, and then out of sheer dumb luck, um, we went into the field um, with one of our vaccine, with a vaccine battery on a uh, foreign policy related study, um, asking the vaccine battery in August 2014 we went back into the field in August 2015, so one year later. So this is um, you know, pre and post both the big Ebola outbreak and the Disneyland measles outbreak to see how vaccine attitudes um, have changed. Um, so more broadly, um, there are demand reasons for vaccine misinformation and that we still need to do more work to sort of um, understand that people when they are hesitant about vaccines or they have misperceptions about vaccines, they are sort of, there's demand to maintain those beliefs. There are supply reasons for vaccine misinformation, which I haven't really talked about today. So there are reasons why political elites or celebrities or whoever it might be um, want to spread misinformation about um, vaccines. Um, corrections are difficult in the best of circumstances. Um, and that one thing that Brendan and I have been focusing in particular on our more directly political um, work is how can we change the supply of misinformation, how can we get better information out there, um, how can we generate reputational costs for um, the spread of misinformation. So here's just a bunch of uh, further reading of all the stuff that Brendan and I have done together. 
Um, and then finally, my contact information.